Well, Maggie, we're real sorry to inform you that John is dead, and we hate to inform you also that he was gay. What turned these two sweaty studs... You're not even a good kisser. ...into this mystery-solving matron? We've only had one killer in our family. In 1977, the popular cop show Starsky and Hutch tackled a murder mystery centered around a Los Angeles gay bar. The episode features a depiction of queer life that is surprisingly nuanced for the late 70s, including a guest appearance by a real-life drag star. Honey, they couldn't live through the 8.30 show. Then, less than a decade later, an episode of Murder, She Wrote featured a similar storyline, a murder mystery centered around a San Francisco drag Club. But this time, the setting is, well, not quite so realistic. Have you noticed there's something a little strange about this place? And the drag performers are not quite so authentic. I, I can explain everything. But the weirdest part is that despite being set in a San Francisco drag bar, there isn't a single queer character in the entire episode. Unless you count this cat. What's her name? George. So why are they so different? Well, something big happened in American culture between these two episodes that completely transformed TV gay bars. And that involved a presidential election, a pie, and messages from space. Hey, I'm Matt, I make videos about pop culture, and this time we've got a mystery to solve. When gay bars started to appear on TV in the late 1970s, why did they go from relatively authentic to completely bonkers in the 80s? To get to the bottom of that mystery, we're enlisting some experts. Starsky and Hutch and Murder, She Wrote's Jessica Fletcher. I believe it's important for a woman to try and maintain a certain sense of mystery about herself. Let's start by taking a look at Starsky and Hutch. If you're not familiar, it was a show set in Southern California about two cops who go undercover in various wacky costumes based on two real-life cops who actually solve crimes by dressing up in elaborate disguises, including, at one point, a gay couple. And right off the bat, you might notice that the characters on the show have a dynamic that you could easily read as boyfriends. What if I kept driving, I might blow my engine! If you do this again, you're gonna blow a partner! On October 15th, 1977, ABC aired a Starsky and Hutch episode entitled Death in a Different Place. It starts with the guys asking a coworker if he wants to hang out after work, but he has a mysterious late night plan. No thanks, I've got a couple of things to check out tonight. And that plan is hanging out at the Green Parrot, a local gay dive bar. What did a gay dive bar look like in the late 70s? Well, turns out, kind of fun. Oh, I feel like a million tonight, but mm, I'll take them two at a time. It's not that different from a gay dive bar of today. It's dark, relaxed, a little run down. I love this disco ball held together with tape. And on stage, you can see Charles Pierce. He was a real-life drag performer, well-known around Southern California. I talked about him in another video, link to that in the description, but the fact they cast him in this episode doing his trademark Betty Davis impression lends just a little more authenticity to the Green Parrot. The closeted cop meets a guy at the bar, and they head back to his hotel. On the way, they pass a drug deal that is weirdly conspicuous. It looks like one of the guys is just eating the cocaine like it's the last of some Doritos. And then, after the cop passes out drunk in his room, one of the drug dealers, who's afraid he was noticed, sneaks in and murders him. The next day, Starsky and Hutch are surprised to learn about their colleague's death, and even more surprised to learn about how he was last seen. Staggering drunk. The trick. Like the appearance of Charles Pierce, the use of the word trick here, maybe the first time it appeared on TV in the context of a gay hookup, gives the episode a little more realism. And that's not the only real-life touch. At first, the guys are in disbelief. How could he have been gay without my knowing it? Well, how would you have felt about him if he told you? I don't know. It's probably why I stayed in the closet. But as they investigate, they learn more about his life, including that he used to be romantically involved with a gay teacher. That's pretty timely, because when this episode aired, California was mulling a ballot measure called the Briggs Initiative that would have barred gay teachers from working in schools. The teacher, we learn, is now running for office. His character is pretty clearly modeled on Harvey Milk, who in real life was running for office in San Francisco when this aired. The character gets a pretty sympathetic portrayal, including a speech where he explains that society's prejudice forces queer people to remain in the closet. You know, it's you guys. It's society. It's the whole attitude that made John sneak. This kind of character is a huge change from what TV was putting on the air just a few years earlier. For decades, queer people had been depicted primarily as sickos. How dare you judge me? And killers. Arrest me, and then let's just see what happens. But in the late 1970s, that all changed really suddenly, and more realistic, even positive gay characters started appearing, making episodes like this possible for the first time. So, what changed? Well, there were a couple of different factors, but one was that post Stonewall, gay activists started to get a lot more noisy and a lot more aggressive. In decades past, protests were quiet, 
polite. They even had dress codes. But in the 1970s, gay activists turned to more disruptive tactics. For example, there was a time in 1977 that a former beauty queen named Anita Bryant called a press conference to oppose gay rights, and activists were waiting to give her a pie in the face. There was also a rise in what were called zaps, where a big group of queer people would storm into an office and shut it down until their demands were heard. Here's the Gay Activists Alliance taking over the New York Marriage Office in a zap over marriage equality in 1977. Your mother and dad want to get married? Are they gay? In the 70s, when particularly homophobic episodes of TV aired, queer activists would storm the network offices, sometimes sitting in for days. And when that didn't work, they started doing zaps live on the air. Here's Mark Siegel crashing the CBS Evening News to demand more attention for LGBTQ issues. Secretary Thank of State Kissinger is in London now. CBS's policy. This worked, by the way. After this incident, Walter Cronkite and Siegel started talking, and coverage actually improved. These zaps became increasingly disruptive and embarrassing for the networks, and executives were getting desperate for a way to stop them. And that's when an answer to their problem presented itself. Two new queer organizations appeared, one on the West Coast and one on the East, and they offered the networks a deal. If TV shows didn't want any more occupations or on-air interruptions, they could work with gay and lesbian organizations to fix the negative depictions before they aired. TV networks were into that, and they started taking notes from queer consultants in the 70s. In the book Alternate Channels, Stephen Capsudo notes that gay consultants contributed a bunch of changes to this episode of Starsky and Hutch. Their notes led to the characters styled after Harvey Milk, the details about gay teachers, the speech about prejudice, and details about the gay cop being a decorated hero. You saved our act, we owe you. Within just a few years, authentic depictions of gay issues would become a lot more sparse on TV, but we'll get to that in a bit. First, watch how the guys handle the murder investigation. When they go to talk to their captain, they find out that there's a lot of pressure to cover up what happened. The department's under a lot of pressure right now to allow gays on the force. So? So the department is not anxious to let the world know that one of its finest might have been a homosexual. This was another real-life issue at the time. The Los Angeles Police Department strongly opposed allowing gay cops to serve. The episode's also pretty unflinching in its depiction of seediness, with drug deals and dingy hotels and sex workers. And because these elements are so realistic, it really stands out when they run into one character who feels a little cartoonish. A sex worker who, for some reason, has an intense Cockney accent. This is a big case for you, love. She sounds like she's auditioning to be Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd, a role that was played for many years by Angela Lansbury, who we will get to in just a bit. Another aspect of this episode that I find deeply authentic is just the look of the show. They keep commenting on how hot it is, and there's visible sweat and grime all over everybody in a way that you just don't see on TV shows today. There's a general dirty haze everywhere you look, like you just smell the setting. And I can tell you, when I've spent time in LA, I felt exactly like these guys, overheated and filmy with sweat. These sweat stains are maybe the part of the episode that feels to me the most authentic. Anyway, the guys keep snooping around, and eventually they get a lead that the murderer might be a corrupt cop. They set up a stakeout at the gay bar, and we get another look at the place and some fantastic disco. <laughs> Aside from the music, this place feels pretty similar to bars today, down to the people dancing in the crowd. Wait, is that Ellen DeGeneres' robot from Epcot? There's a confrontation, the guys shoot wildly in a confined, crowded area, great police work, and then they catch their guy. Good job. The episode ends with Starsky and Hutch reconsidering their attitudes towards gay people, especially since they realize they've kind of a gay vibe themselves. 75% of the time we spend together and you're not even a good kisser. How do you know that? Many years later, the actors from the show talked about how, yeah, it was actually pretty homoerotic, and they were aware of it. If you want to hear that whole story, check out my Patreon. I've got a bonus video there about how they finally acknowledge the queer vibe, and I'll be posting more bonus videos over the next few weeks. As gay episodes of TV go, this one's pretty good for the time. It brings up a lot of issues that audiences might not have otherwise heard about, handles them pretty fairly, thanks in large part to the queer activists giving notes behind the scenes, and it wasn't the only show to do so. Lots of other shows started including queer content around this time, like All in the Family, and Barney Miller, and Three's Company, and many more. Networks started working on a bunch of new shows with gay main characters. There was an American adaptation of Are You Being Served, there was a TV series of the movie La Caja Fall, also known as The Birdcage, and there was a sitcom called Brothers that featured a gay man as the main character. As the 70s came to a close, it looked like TV was going to be queerer than ever, and then all of that ground to a halt. So what happened? Why did all those shows in development get cancelled and put on hold? Why did drama suddenly drop queer characters and sitcoms with queer storylines become so scarce? And why did queer bars on TV get a very strange makeover? 
For some examples of what I'm talking about, let's take a look at an episode of Murder, She Wrote that aired in 1984. Murder, She Wrote, if you're not familiar, is a cozy mystery show that ran from 1984 to 96 about a nice retired lady who just can't resist murders. Not committing them, as far as we know, but solving them. I personally love this show mostly because it stars international treasure Angela Lansbury as Jessica Fletcher, who you might know from Beauty and the Beast, Sweeney Todd, Bedknobs and Broomsticks, and this sensual bathtub. I think femininity and sexuality go hand in hand. Where Starsky and Hutch is gritty and true to life, Murder, She Wrote is comfortable and polite. Starsky and Hutch is crooked and urban, Murder, She Wrote is steady and based in a small town in Maine. But even though they're very different shows that appeal to very different audiences, they're still useful to compare, because they both reflect what was popular on TV when they were on. And although their gay bar episodes both have a pretty similar setup, the execution could not be more different. Season 1, Episode 4 of Murder, She Wrote, has Jessica traveling to San Francisco to meet one of her approximately 10,000 nieces, a young woman named Victoria who appears to be a spray tan model. Victoria's about to marry her fiancé, Howard, but she feels like he's hiding something. She found a mysterious matchbook in his pocket from an expensive nightclub called Les Champignons. So Jessica and Victoria go to the nightclub to see if Howard's been taking another woman there. Jessica's keen observational senses tell her that something is amiss. Have you noticed there's something a little strange about this place? And I don't think I'm spoiling anything to reveal that this is, in fact, a drag bar. Something neither character seems to realize at first. But to be fair, why would they? This is a very peculiar drag bar. Starsky and Hutch's Green Parrot was a fairly authentic depiction of a gay bar, dark, sweaty, a little debauched. This place is more like a night at the opera. There's a snooty mater d', tuxedos, chandeliers, a water fountain, suits and evening gowns and furs. The performers are locked into seven-year contracts. One of the strangest elements is a stand-up played by Gabe Kaplan from Welcome Back, Cotter. He's apparently left the sweat hogs behind to become a pioneering comedian. I'm the first guy that did his own rim shots. There are a handful of signs that there's something queer afoot. Some pink flamingos on stage, maybe a reference to the John Waters film. Also, there's one lonely leather man in the audience. Must have gotten lost on his way to the Eagle. This is the most bonkers depiction of a drag nightclub I have ever seen. And one of the weirdest parts is that there's so little drag in the episode that it was actually kind of hard for me to find clips of it. The only drag we see are this character in the background who seems to be losing their wig, it's hard to say, they're so small you can barely see them, and a song that gets cut off almost immediately. There's a somebody I'm longing to see. I hope that he... We only get a few notes in when there's a scream and one of the performers runs from backstage for the exit. A cop instantly appears and points a gun wildly at the audience, similar to this moment in the movie Female Trouble and the climax of Starskin Hutch. Guess that's just a cop thing. And then the performer crashes into the table and we get the big reveal. Howard? Howard wasn't taking another woman to the bar, he was working there as a drag performer. But don't worry, he's straight. As soon as we come back from commercial, we see him and Victoria making out, just to clear up any doubt. It was just a job. I know! Isn't it wonderful? And in case you're wondering, yes, there has just been a murder, and he's being held by the police as a suspect, but I guess that's just a huge turn on for this couple. God, I'm and not just them. We see one of the other performers in his dressing room also making out with a woman. Not just any woman, but the wife of the club's owner. Throughout this entire episode, there isn't a single identifiably queer character. Literally everyone connected with the San Francisco drag bar is heterosexual. So just to be clear, this is a drag bar in San Francisco, staffed by heterosexuals, putting on shows for a straight audience. It's like every gay person in the city got raptured. The artifacts of gay culture are still there, just no gay people. This absence of queer people is part of a larger trend on TV in the 1980s. After that brief period of inclusivity in the 70s, queer characters suddenly became a lot harder to find for a couple of reasons. One of the big reasons was a huge technological breakthrough in getting messages from God, or at least the people who claimed to speak for him. In the late 1970s, a handful of celebrity preachers discovered satellite TV, and it completely transformed how they reached their flock. This was a relatively new technology with none of the gatekeepers of over-the-air broadcast TV, and suddenly they could beam shows like The 700 Club into tens of millions of American homes. They became a huge cultural force almost overnight. One of the main targets of their sermons was homosexuality. Televangelists like Jerry Falwell railed against queer people, and one of his subordinates, Donald Wildman, organized boycotts targeting networks that had queer characters. They also pushed hard on a political agenda, and they loved the Republican candidate in the 1980 election, a former California governor named Ronald Reagan. During the 80 campaign, Reagan said that gay people were, quote, 
asking for recognition and acceptance of an alternative lifestyle which I do not believe society can condone, nor can I. Televangelist support helped deliver a landslide victory for Reagan. In 1980, he won 44 states to Carter's six. Republicans took control of the Senate for the first time since 1955. To TV executives and advertisers, Reagan's landslide victory made it look like the country had shifted way to the right, in particular in opposition to homosexuality. So, nervous TV execs responded immediately. A writer on the show, Trapper John M.D., remembered that just days after the election, he started getting network pressure to rewrite an episode that involved a gay pride parade. Other shows cut gay storylines, shows that were in development with gay characters either got canceled or moved to cable where they were seen by far fewer people. By and large, shows with marginalized, working-class, urban characters were out. Shows with white nuclear families living in prosperity were in. And within just a few years, gay characters on TV were vanishingly few. And with gays increasingly invisible on TV and in the culture at large, they were about to face a new and overwhelming challenge. In the second year of Reagan's presidency, the CDC gave a name to a mysterious deadly syndrome primarily affecting gay men. Despite mounting deaths, the Reagan administration refused to acknowledge a burgeoning epidemic, and so it fell to community activists to take action. To that end, they adapted Zap-style tactics from the past. They stormed the CDC and they shut it down to protest the lack of response. They put a giant condom on a conservative lawmaker's house. They arranged a die-in on Wall Street to protest drug company profiteering. Once again, these tactics were effective at getting people in power to confront issues that they didn't want to deal with. And cities like San Francisco were at the forefront of the epidemic. Groups like the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and Order of Drag Nuns dedicated themselves to fundraising and education, and they became a model for community service around the world. And that's one of the things that jumped out at me about this episode of Murder, She Wrote. Knowing that the drag scene was so vital to the San Francisco gay community at this time, it's weird to see an episode set at a drag club, but without any queer people. Also. Take a look at the difference between the senior cops on Starsky and Hutch versus Murder, She Wrote. Both Murder, She Wrote and Starsky and Hutch are set in a gay milieu, and both shows have senior cops with a secret. When Jessica first encounters the detective in charge of the case, he's gruff and dismissive. Well, that's my office persona. Well, it just goes to show you can't go by first impressions. On Starsky and Hutch, the cop's secret is that he's bringing men back to hotel and having gay sex. On Murder, She Wrote, the cop's secret is that he's actually kind of a softy. Starsky and Hutch gives us a queer setting and then directly engages with the lives of queer people who are there. But Murder, She Wrote uses the queer setting as a backdrop and then pretends that gay people don't exist. Eventually, Jessica and the detective figure out that the gunshot was muffled by a pillow, which I don't think that's how guns work, but okay. Then Jessica realizes that the pillow's color was faded and remembers that the rimshot comedian has the only dressing room with a window that would have caused a pillow to fade. That seems entirely circumstantial. Anyone could have grabbed that pillow. But the comedian confesses anyway. He gave me a shot. I gave him a shot. But um -pum. The episode ends with Howard exonerated, and just to drive home the fact that he's straight, he immediately marries Victoria. All right, you two, we get it. Stop shoving it down our throats. Then to cap it off, the wedding is interrupted when an agent rushes in to tell Howard that a soap opera wants to cast him as a recurring character, and he'll need to fly to LA immediately because they start shooting on Monday. Now. I haven't been cast on a soap opera yet, so I don't know how they do things, but I have to assume it's very rare that a show hires an actor who did not audition, and in fact didn't even know that he was up for a role, and then interrupts his wedding to tell him to be on set ready to shoot in three days with no rehearsals. I guess that's showbiz. <laughs> I tease, but I also love this show. The point of Murder, She Wrote is not to be realistic. It's not Starsky and Hutch, it's borderline fantasy. We've already established that San Francisco drag clubs are staffed exclusively by heterosexual men, so why not go nuts? Congratulations, Howard. Have a great time in LA. Maybe while you're there, you can go to the Green Parrot. Now, while I do like this episode, the absence of gay people does stand out in a way that I think is a little eerie. Starsky and Hutch gave us a gay bar full of real gay people and one possible robot. Murder, She Wrote shows us what seems like it should be a gay bar, just without any gays. Like something unexpectedly came and took all the queer people away. Which of course was actually happening in real life due to the epidemic. I don't think Murder, She Wrote is trying to make a statement about HIV. I think the absence of queer people just reflects trends of the time. HIV had hardly been mentioned on scripted TV at this point. TV executives in the 80s didn't want to upset advertisers. And advertisers didn't want to get boycotted by religious extremists. But it does feel unintentionally chilling to see a world where all the gays are simply missing. Because pretending that gays didn't exist was the Reagan administration's approach to HIV. By 1984, scientists had been aware of HIV for years, but the Reagan administration chose to ignore it. 
The president said nothing about it in his first term, and the government only allocated a few hundred thousand dollars to deal with an entire epidemic. White House officials confirm that the president has never talked with his Surgeon General about AIDS, or read the report Dr. Koop sent him last October. The fact that it has taken the president five years to begin to even address this problem publicly demonstrates that this administration hasn't given it the level of commitment that it deserves. By the time Reagan briefly mentioned HIV in 1985, 20,000 people had died. But even though television executives and elected officials wanted to pretend queer people didn't exist, the stars of those shows used their platforms to bring attention and funding to the epidemic. This is Paul Michael Glazer, who played Starsky and his real-life family. They had a personal connection to HIV. In 1981, his wife Elizabeth received a blood transfusion. This was before every donation was tested for HIV like they are today. She contracted the virus, then passed it along to her two kids, one through breastfeeding and the other in utero. After she and the kids were diagnosed, Elizabeth decided to become an advocate for people living with HIV, and the family used Paul's celebrity attention to host fundraisers and appear on talk shows and give speeches. Here's Elizabeth at the Democratic National Convention, criticizing the Republicans for inaction on HIV. Exactly four years ago, my daughter died of AIDS. She did not survive the Reagan administration. Twenty years ago, I wanted to be at the Democratic Convention because it was a way to participate in my country. Today, I am here because it's a matter of life and death. The family also founded the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, which to this day conducts testing and counseling and research in over a dozen countries at thousands of sites. And their son Jake is an ambassador for the organization. And Angela Lansbury? She's been an HIV advocate too. In fact, she frequently made use of her Murder, She Wrote star power. When the show hit its 200th episode, CBS and Universal wanted to throw a party to celebrate, but Angela asked them to donate the money they would have spent to the Foundation for AIDS Research instead. When a cruise company hired her to christen a new ship, she only agreed to come if they donated $1 million to AIDS research. She also recorded this PSA to tackle the lack of education out there. You may think you can't get AIDS because you're not in a high-risk group, but risk comes from what you do, not who you are. Get the facts. That message aired immediately before episodes of Murder, She Wrote. So even if many shows were ignoring HIV, at least the people on the shows were doing what they could to get the word out. For a brief window at the end of the 70s, TV was moving toward authentic depictions of gay issues on scripted shows and on the news. But then, unfortunately, pressure from religious extremists erased gay stories from the airwaves at a time when frank discussion of what was happening in the gay community was more crucial than ever and had the potential to save lives. Back in the 80s, there was a famous protest slogan, silence equals death. The lack of information, the silence from leaders, the invisibility of the epidemic literally killed people. Am I blaming Murder, She Wrote for that? No, of course not. I love this show, and I think this episode is a lot of fun. But I can't shake the eerie feeling of seeing San Francisco in the 80s without any gay people, because that almost happened. And that's why I'm so grateful to folks like Angela Lansbury and the whole Glazer family for using their platform to end that silence. Thanks to them and many other activists and allies, that silence was filled with education and advocacy. Especially in the late 80s and into the 90s, we started to see TV shows gradually returning to showing frank, authentic depictions of queer people's lives. Not just about HIV, but on a wide range of issues, on a wide range of shows. In fact, since then, there's been so much progress through the 2000s and the 2010s that queer people have unprecedented visibility on television now. For example, take a look at this recent episode of Doom Patrol. It's written by Tom Farrell, a gay writer, and the scene features a gay superhero. People like us, we gotta stick together. Keep your head up, nothing lasts forever. Keep Scenes like these, and knowing how far we've come, is why it makes me feel so glad every time I see television put thriving queer people back into queer bars. In making this video, I found a lot more fascinating stories that I just didn't have room for in this script, about other TV gay bars, about where the young man who crashed the news broadcast is today, and also about Angela Lansbury acting as a matchmaker for one of her backup dancers on Broadway. I'm posting those stories in bonus videos over on Patreon. The first is up already, and I'll be posting more over the next few weeks. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's time for me to make like a banana and split. Ba -dum -ba.